Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the podcast, we are going to be talking about two of the most iconic now-flying aircraft. It's going to be the 747 and the A380. Okay, We are going to be talking about why they were constructed in the first place, what the reason was, what kind of problem they tried to solve, and why they don't seem to sell or be used any longer. So stay tuned, I think you're going to love this episode. Right guys, this video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org solves a problem that I wish that someone would have solved for me when I was younger. They make math and physics fun. So if you are like me and you kind of shudder when you think about math, well then I want you to check out the link below. The 501st of you who does so will get 20% off their annual fee, but it's completely free to check it out. Right guys, so... Why are the Boeing 747 jumbo jet and the Airbus A380 super jumbo disappearing from the airlines around the world? What's the reason that these giants who are such icons of the aviation world, why are they not selling? Well, in order to understand this, we need to kind of go back and have a look at what kind of problems they were constructed to solve. So if we start with the, uh, with the Boeing 747, one of my personal favorites, it was started to be constructed back in the uh, 1960s and it was constructed to help solve the problem of an increase in the, um, in the intercontinental travel. So there's more and more passengers who wanted to fly, the airport started to become quite congested and the, uh, the Boeing, the biggest Boeing at the time, the Boeing 707, just wasn't big enough. So Pan American Airlines and some of the other majors came to Boeing and said, listen, we need a bigger air- aircraft. And it would be great if it was a little bit quicker as well. So Boeing engineers started looking into it and they started putting together different uh, versions of it. But what one thing that you have to understand, which I think a lot of people don't, is that back in the 1960s, everybody, the whole world thought that the future of aviation was going to be supersonic travel. So Boeing didn't want to go in and spend a mountain of money, which is what they needed to do in order to build this aircraft, just in order to see it be scrapped because it wasn't supersonic. So Boeing kind of hedged their bets a little bit by building the 747 to be just as good of a freighter aircraft as a passenger aircraft. That way they said, if it turns out that the airline industry actually does turn into this supersonic travel boom, well then, the 747 will still be able to be used as a subsonic freighter, which we know that's still going to be a market for. And this is going to be um, important later on in this podcast, so just remember that. Now, the 747 was a remarkable aircraft, and still is. It's still one of the fastest airliners out there. It uh, cruises around Mach 0.85, and just as a comparison, the, uh, the Boeing 737 that I'm flying uh, has a maximum cruise Mach number of 0.81. So the 747 is much quicker than the 737. It can carry a uh, good 450 to almost 600 people, depending on uh, passenger seat configuration. And generally speaking, it is fairly economical, providing that it is full. And this is a key to remember. Now, the Airbus A380 was constructed in a completely different era. So the A380 started to be thought about from an engineering standpoint in the late 1980s, beginning of 1990s, all right? Airbus wanted to have a competitor to the 747. They wanted a super large um, aircraft themselves to sell. And um, when they started looking into it, they, they wanted to build something that was even bigger. So they constructed the 380 to, be, uh, to have 40% more floor space. Um, to be more modern in every single way, more economical to use. But the fact that it had 40% more floor space also meant that it can carry between 500 and 850 people depending on configuration. Once again, it is only really cheap if you can manage to fill all of those seats. Right? So even though it's very, very, uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, a technological marvel, which it really, really is, the only way to make money is to be able to fill the seats, otherwise it doesn't make money. 
All right, so once again, remember that. The 380 is equally fast as the 747. It also cruises around Mach 0.85. But compared to the 747, which has sold almost 1,500 aircraft, or probably a little bit more than that by now, the, uh, the 380 has only sold about 350 or so. And a large amount of those have gone to Emirates Airlines, which I'll talk about in a second. So, so why is it then that the... Um, that the Airbus 380 is not selling. And why is it that we're seeing the bigger air, um, airlines out there, like um, the big three in the US, for example, started to fade them out? I think the last 747 disappeared just last year from um, Delta Airlines, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the reason for this um, is twofold, all right? First of all, well, it's probably more than that, but the two major reasons. First of all, like I was saying in my episode about why the three-engine aircraft disappeared, we have a similar problem with the four-engine aircraft, which is it has four engines. Four engines is expensive. It's expensive to equip with four engines. It's expensive to maintain the four engines. So an aircraft really need to be carrying a lot of passengers in order to motivate having four engines running, especially when you compare it to the competitor aircrafts out there, like the um, Boeing 777 and the Airbus 350, which has can carry less passengers, but only with two engines, right? So we have a cost issue here. But the single biggest reason that it's not really working is that the Airbus 380 especially, but also the 747, was built on a concept called a bespoke hub system. All right, bespoke hub system, um, it's called like that because it was built on the fact that um, the routes, airline routes, transcontinental routes, was built like um, the hubs of a bicycle wheel. So you had big airports in different parts of the world to which feeder airlines would feed passenger in. So the smaller airport would feed passengers into these larger airport, and from the larger airport, the long haul air, um, aircraft would then take the passengers to where they wanted to go, all over the globe. Right? That was what the reality looked like back in the 1960s when um, the 747 was built, um, and that what Airbus bet was going to happen in the future to a larger extent. Okay, so even though these were built at two different periods of time, they were both thought about, you know, to, to use the same kind of model, which is this hub system. Uh, what is actually happening though, and what we've seen, and what actually Boeing saw already in the 1990s, is that this bespoke hub system is kind of breaking down because of um, deregulations of the of, you know, between countries and the way that, that uh, countries communicate with each other, uh, it is now easier to fly not only from one hub to another hub, but to fly from a small airport to another small airport. And this makes the, the whole airline industry look completely different than what these big giants were built for. So, like I said, Boeing saw this already in the uh, 1990s, which is why they didn't start building an even bigger aircraft to compete with the Airbus 380. They did, however, um, re-equip and remake the 747 to be more mm, economical, to have newer wings, newer engines and so on, but they didn't go in and build a completely new air, um, aircraft. Airbus did, and it cost them close to 25 billion euros to do. This is a figure that the Airbus 380 will never be able to recoup, okay? It's a huge investment. Um, what Boeing said was that, hmm, we think that what's going to happen in the future is not a bespoke hub system, but it's a point-to-point -point system. So where a point-to-point -point system is, you fly from one airport to another airport, there might be a smaller airport, might be smaller uh, gates and so on, so let's build a very, very economical air aircraft that can take maybe between 200 and 400 passengers instead, instead of building one that can take 
600, 700. And let's make sure that these air, um, aircraft can actually be used on all of these smaller airports. And that's exactly how the world is looking now. If you look at low fare airlines starting to pop up, um, Norwegian long haul is one of them. Uh, but even the uh, even the, the existing airliners are starting to fly more point to point instead. And also on top of that, you have to remember that um, what both what business passengers wants is not to be able to fly a lot of people at maybe eight o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock and four o'clock. What they want is they want more times where they can fly out. So they maybe want maybe six flights a day from Heathrow to New York rather than three flights for the big aircraft. So this is something that the airlines have also understood, which means that they're using smaller aircraft and flying more often. And that way they can satisfy the business class passengers, which pays a lot more money. So as you can see, the, the premises of which the giants were built did not really happen. And this is always a problem in the airline industry because it takes 15, 20, maybe even longer than that years to, um, to develop an aircraft. So an air, aircraft manufacturer have to have an idea of what the world will look like in 20 years. And they're betting all of their money on that. 25 billion euros Airbus bet on the hub system. And then it didn't pan out. So you're sitting there with an aircraft that is hard to fill, okay, especially in the winter for most airlines. Maybe on the hot summer month you can fill on certain routes and then it's economical, but on the, in the winter month you might not be able to fill them. Um, and it's just not economical. It doesn't make money for the airlines, which is all it's about when it comes to the airlines. But then you might ask, what about Emirates then? Emirates is by far the biggest uh, customer for the Airbus A380. Uh, they have recently made another purchase order and Airbus was really honest with going out and saying that without that order, they would shut down the Airbus 380 line completely. Um, well, Emirates is unique in the way that they are situated in the world, right? Dubai, their major hub, is working exactly in the way that the Airbus 380 hub system was supposed to work, as in it's uh, connecting continents, so you can fly from Europe via Dubai to Australia, from Asia via Dubai to Africa, or from pretty much any part of the world you can connect in Dubai to fly on with the, um, the Airbus 380. So, so the um, Emirates have managed to actually make the Airbus into the money machine that, um, that Airbus wanted it to be. And this is most likely why um, Emirates continue to buy them. And also Emirates knows that they've made a huge investment. And if the uh, Airbus 380 line shuts down, well, it's going to be very hard to find spare parts and to keep their existing fleet going. So it is in both the interest of Emirates for the Airbus 380 line to continue and for, um, for Airbus to continue it, okay? Right, so what about the future then? Well, um, in the case of the 747, it's slowly disappearing. It's an old aircraft, it was built in the 60s and no matter how much um, Boeing is trying, it's still going to be an old technology aircraft. But remember what I said in the beginning, they did build it to be a good freighter. And it is very likely that we will continue to see the 747 fly as a freighter uh, for many, many years to come because it is brilliant at doing exactly that. Airbus 380, not as much, right? It was built to be able to be a freighter, but more like a hybrid, which would take both passengers and cargo, okay? Uh, so it's likely that we see the 747 continue as a freighter for many years and probably as a very uh, VIP um, aircraft as well. Um, you know, there's always going to be a market for that. The um, President of the United States has ordered more, I think three more 747s as Air Force One. Um, the Airbus, um, Airbus will probably dis the Airbus 380 will probably disappear if if I get to guess unless something happens and this is a point that I wanted to make as well if something happens geopolitically that brings us back to the hub system then it is very possible that we'll see these giants come roaring back because it is a fact that the airports of the world are congested and that we do need these big giants in order to help that congestion come down so if something happens to the current political landscape 
they might come back. Otherwise, I think that at least for now, we will probably see more aircraft like the um, Boeing 777, the Boeing 787 and the Airbus 350 going from here. That's it, guys. That's what I had about this. Uh, I want to thank my sponsor to this episode, Brilliant.org. Like I said in the beginning, if you are struggling with maths and physics, if you can't really motivate yourself to, to read it because you think it's really boring, well, then what you need is someone to motivate you, just like I needed when I was young. And remember, you do need that physics knowledge and that mathematic knowledge in order to get through whatever career it is, basically, but especially in the airline career. So... I want you, if you have that <laughs> feeling about mathematics, to go down, click the links below. Uh, the 501st of you who does that will get 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant. You can go in there, they will motivate you, they will show you how to do things in a quite fun way. So do that now and um, yeah, I hope you'll enjoy it and let me know what you think about it. Also guys, I want to take this opportunity to thank my, uh, my Patreon crew, right? the people who are helping me out on Patreon. You're an amazing group of people. Um, I, I use my Patreon crew for a lot of things, like previewing my videos, like helping me with thumbnails and giving me general feedback, all right? Um, they're doing exactly that and it helps the channel a lot. So if you are a patron, thank you very much for all the hard work you're doing for me and the channel and for the support you're giving me. And uh, for those of you who are interested, there's a link below, check out Patreon. And otherwise, I hope that you have at least clicked the subscription button and the notification bell so you know when I uh, publish new videos. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.